Good morning. And welcome to worship here at First Congregational Church of Benzonia United Church of Christ. Seems like the time change has got everyone just a little turned around and spinning today. So I invite you to take a deep breath as we get started this morning to find our way in our seats and all the good stuff that's going out in the fellowship hall that we'll hear about in a minute. But welcome to worship. If you are joining us on Facebook Live, I encourage you to put in the chat where you are watching from and joining us from if you are able so that we know where our neighbors and friends are this morning. I hope that you have split screen second device downloaded or printed out the order of worship so that we may know that you may know what's going on and where we are in the service and all the hymns and all that fun stuff. Um, I draw your attention to the looking ahead in the back of the bulletin. It's all pretty fairly standard fare. Diane will be out of the office from the 13th to the 17th. So don't be surprised that if you call the church, I answer the phone. Nothing's wrong. Diane's just out to, to deer camp. So um, we'll take that there. I received an email from Roger this past week that asked me to highlight um, the Spark series that's going on. I know that Ruth has spoken a couple of times out in Fellowship Hall about it, but he was bringing to uh, my attention to ask to share with you the fun stuff that's going on Sunday afternoons over at the Mills Community House. Um, there's all kinds of exhibits going on throughout the month upstairs in the community room. So if you've got a few minutes, go over and check it out. And if Roger's there, say hi. So it's a good place to, to meet and greet people. Are there other announcements to be lifted up for the good of the day? Good morning. As you can see, the casserole soup and I guess check mix auction is uh, taking bids. Um, this will uh, continue t um, until half an hour after um, service ends, and then we will award the winners. Um, this is presented by Christian Education, and I want to thank everyone who participated, who made um, items, who's helped with everything, and uh, thanks to Andy and Christy for bringing some cherry pies. So um, there will be three cherry, cherry pies on the table soon. Um, all proceeds will go to special projects for Christian Education. And once again, um, we're very grateful. There's some really good food out there. Um, this month for big is baking items. So with the holidays coming up, we would like to collect flour and sugar, baking soda, baking powder, those kinds of things. There'll be a list up tomorrow and um, it'll go out in the Friday blast. Those can be um, put in the cart right outside the door. And then just a reminder that we have gotten started on our Christmas program. And thank you to Christy Case, to Carolina, and all of our, our young people who are working hard on that. Um, I think that's... Yeah. You want to talk about the um, fall thank offering? Oh, yeah. Sure. Yeah, I think you can. <laughs> Um, so Beth mentioned the Women's Fellowship Fall Thank Offering will be coming out. Look for that in the mail soon. That will be divided between Benzie Food Partners and um, a service project we're doing here at the church for feminine hygiene kits. So um, be sure to check out that letter. If you have any questions, don't hesitate to ask one of us. Also, you probably noticed that the Community Ecumenical Thanksgiving service is on the 19th at 3 o'clock out at Blaine. And um, anyone who wants to sing in a mass choir, we are practicing here Thursday afternoons at 3 p.m. if you're interested. This week we will be here. Actually, we're going to practice down in the Sunday school room, however, because we know the Historical Society is here at 4 o'clock, um, and I suspect they'll be arriving a little early. So please join us if you want to practice for that. The music is also available as well as recordings. Let me know. Yeah. Um, so uh, this Friday and Saturday are the dates for the play. We're doing the play that goes wrong. Um, please come. I think it's a, it's a it's really fun. I've really enjoyed working on it. I think it it's a it's a good thing to go to. 
helps f with <laughs> uh, other plays and musicals to, you know, fund them. Um, and uh, to anybody that ordered stuff from the fundraiser for me, um, that got delivered. It's in, um, it's in my mom's car. Um, so if you ordered stuff, please, yeah. <laughs> if you ordered stuff, just uh, come see me. <laughs> Thank you. It's like a trick or trunk at Carolina's car after the service. <laughs> I just want to remind people there are only about nine cards on the table there. They are for the jail inmates, and I've left some things that you can use to write on them, and I hope you will because we're going to deliver them on Monday. Thank you. Any other announcements for this morning? Then I draw you to joys and concerns. Um, in that email that Roger sent me, he let me know that Jim, Snow, uh, Jim Wolf had passed away um, and that it was Helen's last surviving sibling. So um, to hold the Wolf family in prayer. And for those that haven't seen the newsletter yet, Marsha Lee passed away this past week. Um, so to hold her family in prayer. And um, I want to say it. Um, if you haven't seen the emails, the social posts, um, heard about how this community has fractured this week, Jim Sheets passed away Wednesday morning. So before we read the name of the saints and his name is said, I want you to be aware. Um, I did it without crying, so we're good. <laughs> so other um, joys and concerns, those places where we have rejoiced this week and those places where we have cried almost uncontrollably. <laughs> um, yes, um, my father passed away early Wednesday morning, and um, my brother was there. I'd spent the night with him and had gone home to get a little nap, and I didn't make it back in time. Um, Patty arrived right after he passed, so she was with us, and um, he went peacefully, and um, that's all that we could hope for. Um, as um, the last day on Tuesday, there were people from this church that were in and out. We had 15 different visitors that day. And um, I just want to thank everyone um, who visited him during the last, probably last month of his life. Um, we appreciate that. And um, he was an integral part of the community, the church. Um, and, and a lot of people's lives, and we appreciate everyone who came to see him. Um, his service will be on um, Saturday, December 2nd. It will be held here, and um, there will be a luncheon following. And um, the participants, uh, most of the participants um, are former students, and so the speakers are former students. He has honorary pallbearers. And um, that's, those were his choices. Um, a couple of people asked me what we were going to do about flowers and memorials. Um, I always, being the person that does not care for flowers all that much, <laughs> um, we are going to, um, as memorial um, donations, um, everything will go to the church. We have plans for that, for something. And um, so if you feel the need to do that, that, um, that can go to the church. So. Um, once again, thank you, and um, to the women on Wednesday um, afternoon who loved on me, um, thank you so much. This is where I needed to be that afternoon, and I love each and every one of you. Other joys and concerns? Then let us, oh, Phyllis. Uh, I'd just like prayers for um, my aunt's family. Her name is Fumi Tanoi. He, she is my third, my mother's third down sister. She is in serious kidney failure. She's got about 6% kidney function at the moment. She's not given long with us, and I'm, I may be going home to uh, help with with her family, but prayers for her family as they go through this. <laughs> 
Then let us take all of those places and spaces, the giggles of community gathered and the sorrows of community shattered, and lift them up to God. Amen. I invite you to center yourself. However you get comfortable in that pew, open your heart and your soul. May we prepare for worship. I invite you to join me in the call to worship, the responsive reading printed in the bulletin. In all of our weaknesses and strength, with our youth-filled spirits and aging bodies, we come to be your people, O oh God. Strong in faith and eager with questions, singing our praises and whispering our prayers, we come to be your people, O oh God filled with saintly determination, yet mindful of our human limitations. We come to be your people, O oh God. Made strong in your endless love for us, we know ourselves to be yours, and we come to be your people, O oh God. May we truly become your people today. Amen. Our opening hymn this morning is He Leadeth Me, O Blessed Thought. It's number 370 in the red hymnal. I invite you to stand as you are able in body or spirit to lift your voice.
Our lives are full of mistakes and errors, places where we follow self-generated idols instead of the one true God. We are not alone in these mistakes. All of these who have come before us also have been plagued with temptation and pain and sin. Let us come before God, just as generations of believers have done, and pray for God's forgiveness and grace. Please join me in the unison prayer of confession. Beloved God, who was known to our mothers and fathers and to our spiritual forebearers, have mercy on us. We do not always love you as we would have us love. We do not always do as you would have us do. In our stubbornness, we turn from you when we should turn toward you. Hold us, dear one. Comfort us when we mourn the passing of friends and family, and help us to know that they are rejoicing in your presence. We praise you for the grace you shower on us, constantly forgiving our errors, especially the ones that we don't share with anyone but you. Hear now the silent fears and worries of our heart. It is grace. It is grace to step out of our mistakes and our errors, to take off our sins of our poor judgments like worn out garments. The saints who have gone before us call us to set aside what no longer serves that we might join them in the most wondrous adventure. We are surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses eternally testifying to God's goodness and mercy that has been revealed through Jesus Christ. May this assurance bless us today and every day. Amen. We come to the time now of remembering the saints. I will read the name of those that I am aware of, and um, when we are done with that, for you to lift the names that are on your heart, that they may be named in the cloud of witnesses. 
Jerry L. Smith. Marnie Abbott Curtis. Patricia A. Delaney. Virginia Best. Arnie Black. Betty Hoffman. Jim Wilkinson. Dan Holzel. Oh, you're fine. You're the fine. There's no Russian here. There's no Russian. Marsha Lee. James Wolfe. James Robert Sheets. Are there names to be listed to the role? Doris Ugel and Magdi Bayumi. Chet and Ruth Keefaber. Nancy Lewis Catton. Thank you. Sorry, I forgot that one, Ruth. Stephen Chownick. Sam Kangas. Peyton Birch. Rowena Alane. If you would be in the spirit of prayer with me, please. Loving and gracious God, you have enriched us with such a wonderful church. We have so many faithful examples to draw from and so many stories of faith and trust in you. We lift up this church to you now. May the stories of those from the past be able to encourage us and may we be able to shine your light so that the future generations may look back on our example and feel the same trust and conviction that we do for the saints that have gone before us. Amen. now to the communion table, the table that is open to all. The tablecloth today is not our usual white runner that matches the paraments. It is our All Saints cloth, so that those that we have named and those that we have named in previous years still reside at the table with us. 
and invite you to this table. We come to this table where all the saints have come, as God's peoples always do, with love and hope and questions. We come to this table in our mourning, old, new, or delayed, in our celebration of memories, in our imagination of possibilities, our time yet to come, because here we are all welcomed. In the weeping, in the laughing communion of saints, in a weeping, laughing communion of all of us. Communion holds that sacred story. It's a story that goes way back. It is older than our ancestors, older than anything in this building or the building across the street. To a wind blowing over the waters is how old it is. God's love was in the garden and a flood-drenched rainbow. God's love was in a desert tent, barley fields for gleaning, a slingshot, a mythical big fish, and a new thinged way in the wilderness. There is a sacred story that goes back to a mother in a barn, a foster father and a sky full of distant angels. We love these stories, especially this one of a baby named Jesus, loved by a lowly cow, three magi, whole pack of shepherds, who grew up, who healed people, who told extremely awkward and hard to understand parables, and made even a few people angry. At Passover, he broke the unleavened bread and poured the wine, and himself were saints who slept when he needed friends. But the shelter of love gave that time full of death a hope of awakening resurrection and an Emmaus of self-understanding. And so now we come, clothed in our own sad times, in our cloud of witnesses to hope, all the saints we have known, the saints that we will know, and the saints that we are. Bless us and these gifts. May the Spirit rest upon this table and this time, surrounded tenderly by your memories of saints as on sacred times and tables long ago, so that this loaf may be broken love that this cup, a well of blessings. For we pray in the words of our ancestors that we claim as our own. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors and lead us in temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. We like this story so much better than we do those parables that we've been working our way through. That on the last night that Jesus was, he went to dinner with his friends in an upper room. And after they have lounged and ate and laughed, he took a loaf of bread and he broke the bread. And he lifted it up to God and he gave thanks. He gave thanks for everything that was, for everything that is, and for everything that is to come. Jesus gave thanks. And he gave it to his disciples and he said, take and eat. And every time you do so, do so in memory of me. In the same way, he took the cup and he poured out the wine.
And he lifted it up and he gave thanks to God. He gave thanks for everything that was, for everything that is, and for everything that's yet to come, knowing full well what was to come for him. And he gave it to his disciples and he said, take, drink, do so. And every time you do so, do so in memory of me. It's a cup of forgiveness poured out for you. Please join me in the responsive reading. Taste and see that God is good. Eat this bread. Sharing love, we will never be hungry. Happy are those who take refuge in God. The cup on our table is blessed. Drink deeply, we will never thirst. As has become our customs, if you come down the center aisle, depending if you're on the north side or the south side, I'll give you a piece of bread and then you will take a cup. There is a receptacle at the end of each pew. If you need me to come to you, just give me a head nod and I'll be there. Come for all things are ready.
Please join me in the prayer of thanksgiving. Spirit of Christ, stay with us where we stay, as familiar in our daily plates and cups. Go with us where we go, safe and full of love as the mask across our lips. May we, your eager and sometimes awkward saints, carry us in a communion from which all can share comfort for loss, courage for speaking, compassion for healing. We give you thanks for both the shelter and the road. Amen. We are there. Our first scripture reading this morning comes from the book of Joshua. It is the third chapter, verses 7 through 17. This is after Moses has died and been laid to rest by God, and Joshua has picked up his mantle. May we hear the word of God. And the Lord said to Joshua, This day I will begin to exalt you in the sight of all of Israel that you may know that I was with Moses, so I will be with you. And you shall command the priests who bear the Ark of the Covenant. And when you come to the brink of the waters of the Jordan, you should stand still in the Jordan. And Joshua said to the people of Israel, Come hither and hear the words of the Lord your God. And Joshua said, Hereby you shall know that the living God is among you, and that he will without fail drive out from before you the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Hivites, the Preziites, the Gershites, the Amorites, and the Jebusites. Behold, the ark of the covenant of the Lord of all the earth is to pass over before you into the Jordan. Now therefore take twelve men from the tribes of Israel, from each tribe a man, and when the soles of their feet, the priests who bear the ark of the Lord, the Lord of all the earth, shall rest in the waters of the Jordan. The waters of the Jordan shall be stopped from flowing, and the waters coming down from above shall stand in one heap. So when the people set out from their tents to pass over the Jordan with their priests bearing the ark of the covenant before the people, And when those who bore the ark had come to the Jordan, and the feet of the priest bearing the ark were dipped into the brink of the water, the Jordan overflows all of its banks throughout the time of harvest. The waters coming down from above stood and rose up in a heap far off at Adam, the city that is beside Zephrathan, and those flowing down from the sea to that of the Arabah and the Salt Sea were totally cut off. And the people passed over opposite Jericho. And while all Israel were passing over on dry ground, the priests who bore the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord stood on dry ground in the midst of the Jordan until the nation finished passing over the Jordan. Our second reading comes from the Gospel according to Matthew. It is the 23rd chapter, verses 1 through 12. May we hear the old stories with new ears. Now, Jesus has been in the temple for two chapters previous to this, talking to the scribes and the Pharisees. And now he has turned to the crowd that is gathered around him. Then said Jesus to the crowds and to his disciples, the scribes and the Pharisees sit on Moses' seat. So practice and observe whatever they tell you, but not what they do. For they preach, but do not practice. They bind heavy burdens, hard to bear, and lay them on the men's shoulders, but they themselves will not move with their one finger. They do all their deeds to be seen by men, for they make their phylacteries broad and their fringes long and they love the place of honor at feasts 
and the best seats in the synagogue and the salutations in the marketplaces and being called rabbi by the people. But you are not to be called rabbi, for you have one teacher, and you are all brethren. And call no man your father on earth, for you have one father who is in heaven. Neither be called masters, for you only have one master in Christ. He who is greatest among you shall be your servant. Whoever exalts himself will be humbled, and whoever humbles himself will be exalted. May we be blessed by the reading, hearing, and pondering of God's holy word. I chose that reading. That's out of my uh, Confirmation Bible, 1972. It's not as old as yours, Steve, but it's still my Confirmation Bible. Because all the other versions that I generally read don't talk about faculties, phylacteries, I will get that word correct, and fringes. It just says prayers and garments. But that's such a fun word, right? The phylacteries. Does anybody know what those are? It's the little teeny tiny box that Jewish men wear either on their arm or on their forehead, and it carries scripture and prayers. So what Jesus is saying is that these Pharisees, their phylacteries have gotten to be kind of big. They've got bigger boxes to say, see how important I am. And the fringe on your garment, um, I always took it mean that you're going to stop unraveling at some point in time. That fringe is going to get long enough. You're just going to stop unraveling. Um, the rabbis, the longer the fringe on their shawls, the higher the position they had. So that was a way to know who was the chief priests and whatnots because their fringes were longer. All right. We have been working our way through the latter end of Matthew over the past six weeks or so. We've managed to get through two chapters, and most of them have been filled with really hard parables. Remember I said these are parables that we know, that we think that we really like, but we like them out of the gospel according to Luke, because that's a whole lot more gentler than that out of Matthew. I've got a book that compares them side by side if you actually want to see what that looks like. Matthew gets a little rough. We've had the gnashing and wailing of teeth and being thrown out because they didn't know the dress code. We had um, the heirs and the stewards of the vineyard be killed because the tenants want to keep the land. We've had all of that. We've worked our way through those. This morning, reading um, kind of turns the table a little bit. The reason that Jesus has given all of those parables is because he's been being asked questions. All the way along the line, the last two chapters, the Pharisees, the, the Sadducees, the chief priests, they've all been asking Jesus questions, and we've just been getting his rhetorical answers in the parables. But he's been asked questions about resurrection, and that's where we get whose wife is this woman if she's married to seven brothers. When you get to heaven, who does she belong to? There's a parable there, right? The loyalty and ethics of the two sons who are to go out and work in the vineyard for their father. One says, yes, I'll go, and sits down with his we, and the other one says, yeah, I don't want to, and ends up going, right? We've had questions on law. What do we give to Caesar, and what do we give to God? So this morning's reading offers us a little bit of a different place in the relationship between Jesus and the Pharisees. Um, most of us, I think, have grown up or at least heard a lot that the Pharisees and the Sadducees are the bad guys. You know, they're the, the, they're the bullies in the story usually. They're the ones picking on Jesus. And here we have Jesus this morning that says, no, 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 no. They're, they're really good people. They're just doing their jobs. They tell you that they sit on the seat of Moses. They have the right to tell you the law. Listen to them. They are your teachers, right? Do what they say. Which really puts us in a, in a predicament sometimes, I think, as we start to hear the political season ramping up 
that we're supposed to listen to the people that make the law, that we are to listen to the politicians and they are the ones that interpret the law. Have no worries. I am not gonna make this a political statement. I won't. But I would like to pull a few threads that talk about spiritual, about moral and ethical parts of the politics that Jesus was teaching those that always came near him, the teachings that he speaks to those who are then to interpret the law. When Jesus calls out the Pharisees, he's calling them out to act more in love and justice and compassion, to act with health and dignity for people that are around them instead of bundling up those wonderful burdens and putting it on the shoulders and going, go have a nice day, right? And I know lots of people say that Jesus was not a political man. We only have to look at his disciples to realize that they all had a different interpretation of who he was. And Judas thought he was gonna be a warrior and got really mad at him when he never pulled a sword, right? Some of them, if you read through the gospel according to Mark, as my professor would say, are the disciples, because they don't get anything, right? Jesus is political. Jesus was political when he said, give unto Caesar what is Caesar's. Give Caesar that coin. If that is the tax that is due, his face is on the front of that, belongs to him. Give it to him. But he was also spiritual when he said, give unto God what is God's. To give God thanks and praise, right? Jesus reminds us in morals and ethics, that one that was really hard for us to unpack last week, or maybe it was just hard for me to unpack last week, to love your God with all of your heart and all of your mind and all of your soul and to love your neighbor as yourself. He's ethical when he says, when you feed the hungry and clothed the naked and freed the oppressed, you do this for me. You do this to me. You have done this for me. So the problem with the politics in Jesus' day was the Pharisees and how they interpreted the law. Because they taught it, they didn't always teach it the way it was intended. Jesus' problem is that they talk the walk, but they don't walk the talk. It's, it's one of those do as I say, not as I do kind of situations. Jesus tells them, therefore do whatever they teach you and follow it. But do not do as they do, for they do not practice what they teach. They tie up heavy burdens, hard to bear. It doesn't take long, if you open up your Bibles, to get from the Ten Commandments in Exodus to the next chapter of Leviticus, where we have over 660 laws. Not saying, you know, it didn't take long to get there from ten simple rules that most of us can name at least eight, and then you get your friend to say, what are the two I'm missing, right? That we get to over 660 laws. And these laws were everything from how to make a sacrifice to what you do for restitution, what days you can do this and where you can sit, and how you kill your calf and you, know, you eat your sheep, and it goes on and on. I'll freely admit, when I was in seminary, I skipped over all of it because it repeats over and over and over again, just to make sure you're paying attention. So they take all of these laws and they bundle them up and they put them on people and say, now go out and do. And they're overburdened. From the very beginning of the gospel, according to Matthew, Matthew has been clear to the point in all other directions that Jesus says, I truly tell you, until heaven and earth pass away, not one letter, not one stroke of a letter will pass from the law until it is accomplished. Therefore, whoever breaks one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same will be called least 
in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever does them and teaches them will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. There are few challenges in today's reading when we look at the spiritual, the moral, and the ethical parts of this relationship between the Pharisees and Jesus. The moral aspect in that we hear, practice what you preach, do what I say, not as what I do, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. In this passage, Jesus is critical of the Pharisees' actions, right? Not only because they don't practice what they're teaching, in their practice, the observance of the law becomes such a burden that it falls on the shoulders of others while the Pharisees make their fringe longer and make their phylacteries bigger to say, look at me. We follow Jesus. We follow Jesus as the teacher that he is because Jesus interprets the law with an eye to God's larger vision and love for humanity. Jesus teaches us, but Jesus also shows us how to keep the law in a way that meets the demands of God's justice and God's mercy. Jesus' actions are consistent with his teachings. Over and over and over again, we see Jesus practicing the law in the light of God's justice and mercy. He keeps the Sabbath while bringing God's wholeness to the people. He honors the Sabbath and yet feeds the hungry on that day. He cures the leper and says, go show yourself to the priest. These Pharisees, these interpreters of the law, these teachers present another problem that is even more dangerous than others. It's an ethical problem. I want you to stop and think for a moment some of the teachers that you have had. Some of them that teach you in a kind and generous fashion that really want to see you succeed to get that algebraic equation that you will never use again in your life, right? They want you to be able to do that. And then you've got the other teachers that are just, here is what you need to learn. You're taking a test on Friday. Make sure you pass because you have to pass this test on Friday. Right? There's a difference in the way that we teach. Teachers have enormous influences over us. They place the wrong kinds of burdens, some of those Pharisees did, upon the shoulders of those who listened to their teachings. The problem that provoked Jesus' anger and burden, it's the burdens that the Pharisees impose on people. As one commentator puts it, a myriad of rules, standards, directives, and the whole process easily deteriorated into a moral bean counting. Morals and ethics are not so far apart. That was another class at school. What are, what are morals and what are ethics? It's a great debate in that space. So these burdens that are placed on us don't flow from the test of the law. These burdens arise from their own specialized interpretations of the law. Added to this is the irony that the teachers themselves manage to avoid carrying anything that is required of everyone else. We know that Sabbath observation had become itself a victim of the kind of specialized, interpretive, sometimes arrogant way of being. The burden was artificially placed on the earnest believer by the teacher who controlled the right to interpret. So this teacher is teaching you and saying what is right and what is wrong, but they hold the interpretation. They're not holding it to God's love and God's mercy and God's justice. And I think that we could all go on and have a really long conversation about how that has hurt the church in the long run. When I stand up here, and I mean I, preachers, stand up here and say, this is what it means, without opening up another dialogue of what does it mean to you? How does it affect you? 
What does it mean that we can engage in keeping the laws of God together? When you're told automatically that you're wrong inside a church, it really leaves a big old sour taste in your mouth. How can a God that is so loving and so gracious not love what I've done? Right? It's because humans interpret that. That's enough about how the church can harm people with toxic teaching. But we're also spiritual beings. It's not about how long your fringe is or how prominently you carry your phylacteries, your prayers. It's about doing the work that God calls us to do. Just Jesus really would have been wearing a shawl. He was a rabbi. He would have been wearing the shawl with fringe on it, designating himself as a teacher in the synagogue. But Jesus doesn't wear them as a fashion statement. He doesn't wear his prayer box as a fashion statement. Jesus' message is similar to the prophets that went on before him, and he would have known all of the stories of the prophets, right? We like to credit Jesus for offering a new teaching, but the message that he brings to us runs deep in his learning. What he says is that he learned from the prophets and the saints that came before him. He learned from all of those generations that stand behind him just as each and every one of us stands with a line of saints before us and behind us. Right? We stand on the ways that we were taught and who taught us. Jesus is quoted twice in the gospel, according to Matthew, as saying, I desire mercy, not sacrifice. One of these references is Jesus' response to criticism that he eats with, oh gee, she eats with those tax collectors and those sinners. And Jesus answers, go and learn what it means. I desire mercy, not sacrifice. For I have come to call not the righteous, but the sinner. Later, Jesus repeats this quote from Hosea when he is criticized because his disciples Goodness gracious, his disciples go out and pluck grain in the field. They glean food, which by law needs to be left there for those that are hungry to go and eat. But they pluck it on the Sabbath. Jesus suggests that keeping the law without existing and experiencing and exercising mercy does not fulfill God's expectations. So in light of All Saints Day, who besides Jesus has taught you? The deeply personal experiences that we share in our need for love and justice and compassion and health and dignity. Radical connectedness, genuine humility, deep compassion. This is the vision that Jesus shares with us even in the face of the power that has lost its way. That is what it means to live courageously. Amen. I invite you as you are able in body or spirit to stand and lift your voices for the inserted hymn in the bulletin, You Satisfy the Hungry Heart. And yes, it's a new hymn, but I think it's a familiar tune. So, let's be brave.
Please be seated. And please note, we've already done the Lord's Prayer, so it's not in the bulletin in its usual spot. I invite you to be in a spirit of prayer with me. However you speak with a still speaking God, eyes opened, eyes closed, eyes full of tears, hands folded, reaching for God or for neighbor. However you speak with a still speaking God. O oh, great and wise teacher, we come before you on a day where the time has changed and everything seems a little frazzled and out of space. Settle us, feed us, sustain us, nourish us, that we may go into a weary world and proclaim your love, your law of mercy and justice. May we take the stories that we have been handed from generation to generation to generation and pass them on. All of the giggles and all of the heartache that together we can be witnesses to your love in this world. We pray for our leaders. We pray for the global leaders. May they hear the cries of those in Israel and Pakistan and Ukraine and Russia and China and Taiwan in Benzi County. We pray for those that are hungry, as well as those that have a full table. We pray for those that are lonely, because sometimes we're even lonely when we are surrounded by so many people. We pray for our families all of the love and the laughter and the dysfunction and the arguing and the scattering and the gathering, the differences of opinions, knowing that we can disagree and still be family. And we pray, God, that we learn your laws the 10 easy laws, the two that Jesus gives us. And we lay the burden of more than 600 down. For we are called to live into your love and your justice and your mercy today and every day. Amen. I invite you, as you are able, to stand this morning that we may bless the offertory, whether you have put it in the offertory plate in Fellowship Hall, you have mailed it to the front office, or hit the donate button on the website. May we still stand and acknowledge the gifts that God has brought to us. Please join me in the prayer of dedication printed in the bulletin. Generous God, thank you for the gifts you give and the privilege and honor of bringing your gifts of time, talent, and treasure into your kingdom. Receive our humble offerings and magnify them to meet the needs in our community. Amen. 
Our closing hymn this morning is I'm going to live so God can use me. It is also inserted in the bulletin. And it's okay if you kind of move on this one because it's got a beat. As we prepare to leave this space and go out and be the church, please, if you're visiting, stay and have some coffee, have a treat, talk to some people if you feel like it, <sighs> take a deep breath, know that life is good. If you need the words for let there be peace on earth, it is not in this hymnal, but if you pick up the red hymnal, open up the back cover, it should be right there if you need the words. Maybe someday I'll get a hymnal up here that's got the words in it. That way I can show them, right? I invite you now to turn to your neighbors, north, south, east, and west, and share the sign of peace of Christ with you. May the peace of Christ be with you. So brothers and sisters of Jesus, all of us siblings under God, go forth into this world to serve God with gladness and be of good courage. <sighs> Hold fast to that which is good and render no one evil for evil. Strengthen the faint-hearted, support the weak, help the afflicted, honor all people. Go and love and serve God, rejoicing in the power of the Holy Spirit today and every day. Amen.